Insomnia is characterized by difficulty falling asleep or waking up after a few hours sleep. Difficulty falling asleep is contributed to by an overactive mind. Overstimulation during the day, so much information, racing mind, lots of thought activity going through the mind, and then when one goes to bed, it's difficult to fall asleep so readily, and we end up twisting and turning as the mind is ruminating on thought. It's very important to help achieve a deeper sleep is to downregulate just before sleep. Downregulation by slowing down breathing for 15 minutes before sleep. To do this, simply place one hand in your chest, one hand just above your navel, bring your attention from your mind onto your breathing, pay attention to the slightly colder air coming into your nose and the slightly warmer air leaving your nose and gently soften the speed of your breathing. The whole purpose is to breathe light, to take less air into your body, to the point of air hunger. You know that you have air hunger when you feel that you would like to take in a deeper breath. Air hunger signifies that carbon dioxide increases in the blood and as carbon dioxide increases in the blood, it stimulates the vagus nerve and it helps to bring body and mind into relaxation. You will know that your body and mind is going into relaxation by virtue of the increased watery saliva in the mouth. So for 15 minutes before sleep, Downregulate by taking your attention out of your mind onto your breathing, softening the speed of the air coming into the nose and allowing a relaxed and a prolonged and gentle exhalation. During the inhalation, the vagus nerve steps back. It's more sympathetically driven, whereas the exhalation is primarily under the control of the body's rest and digest response, our body's parasympathetic nervous system. To stimulate the vagus nerve, it's important that we have a very relaxed and a slow and gentle exhalation. Two factors help stimulate the vagus nerve during this exercise. Number one is slow and relaxed and prolonged exhalation. Number two is light breathing to create air hunger. And in terms of preparing your body for deeper sleep, down regulation with light and slow breathing can be very helpful. The second time that you may experience difficulty falling asleep is after having a few hours sleep and then waking up. You're lying in bed, you're partially awake, but you're partially asleep. You're not quite awake enough to get up, nor are you quite exhausted enough to fall back asleep so readily. The factors that can cause you to wake up after a few hours sleep include snoring or obstructive sleep apnea or faster breathing. So for example, if your snoring is hard or if you stop breathing during sleep, this can arouse you from deeper sleep. Another factor, of course, is faster breathing during sleep. If you breathe faster during sleep, the brain senses that the body is under threat and the brain will arouse and as a result, take you out of deep sleep. We have to remember that the brain's primary mode is to ensure survival, to protect the body. Whenever we breathe fast, the brain is interpreting this, especially when we breathe fast during rest and when we breathe fast during sleep, the brain is interpreting that the body is under threat and the brain is there to protect the body. Few factors that contribute to fast breathing during sleep. One is how you breathe during the day. If you have slightly faster and upper chest breathing during wakefulness, that will translate into slightly faster and upper chest breathing during sleep. You are less likely to achieve a deep sleep. You know that your breathing rate is slightly faster if your bolt score is quite low. We are looking for a bolt score of a minimum of 25 seconds. A minimum bolt score of 25 seconds implies that your breathing is functional. If your bolt score is 10 seconds or 15 seconds, your breathing is relatively fast and upper chest, and this is more likely to waken you up from sleep. A second factor is thermal regulation. If for example, you're asleep, but your duvet is too warm and the room is too warm, that can cause your breathing to speed up and that can waken you from sleep. So in order to experience a full night's sleep and deep sleep, we need to look at what is contributing to snoring, what is contributing to obstructive sleep apnea, and what is contributing to faster breathing. From a breathing perspective, it's how you breathe during the day that determines how you breathe during sleep. If you have a low bolt score, this implies that your breathing is faster, harder, and upper chest. So for example, with snoring, there are two types of snoring. There is snoring through the mouth and it goes like this. 
Try closing your mouth and snoring through the mouth. You will find that you cannot snore through the mouth when your mouth is closed. The second type of snoring is nasal snoring and it goes like this. And this is turbulence inside in the nasopharynx. Turbulence inside the nasal cavity and where the nose meets the back of the throat. Now what I would like you to do is to breathe really slowly. Feel the slightly colder air coming into your nose and the slightly warmer air leaving your nose and really slow down the speed of your breathing. And as you breathe slowly, try and snore through your nose. You will notice that it is more difficult to snore through your nose when your breathing is slow. If you improve your bolt score, and every time that you improve your bolt score by five seconds, your breathing is becoming lighter. As your breathing is becoming lighter, the resistance to your breathing during sleep is going to be reduced. Turbulence created by your breathing during sleep is going to reduce. We have to consider that the human airway is a pipe and there are two factors that contribute to resistance to breathing during sleep. One is the narrowness of the pipe, but the second is flow. Flow is your breathing. And if you're breathing hard and fast through a narrow pipe, your increased resistance to breathing. This will cause snoring. At the extreme end of snoring is a condition called obstructive sleep apnea. Obstructive sleep apnea is when you stop breathing during sleep for periods of lasting more than 10 seconds due to collapse of the upper airway. When I'm talking about collapse of the upper airway, I'm talking about there are four places at which the airway can collapse during sleep. The soft palate can fall into the throat, your tongue can fall into the throat, the epiglottis can fall back into the throat, or you can have collapse of the throat itself. We have to consider that during wakefulness, the airway stays open. But during sleep, the upper airway dilator muscles that maintain or help to maintain an open airway can become lazy. A contributory factor to increase resistance to breathing causing collapse of the upper airway during sleep is how hard and fast you breathe. If you can imagine that your upper airway is like a collapsible paper tube, and if you breathe hard and fast through that collapsible paper tube, the walls of the tube fall inwards. Similarly, if you're breathing hard and fast through open mouth or even through nose, the increased negative pressure as air is drawn into the lungs can cause the airway to collapse. We need to look at the human airway from the perspective of an engineer. No engineer is going to look at a pipe without considering flow. In sleep medicine, much more attention is placed in the diameter of the pipe and very little attention is placed in how the person is breathing. If you have an individual with a lower bolt score, this implies faster, harder upper chest breathing, and this is going to increase negative pressure to cause collapse of the upper airway. How do we help reduce the risk of obstructive sleep apnea? Breathe light, breathe slow, and breathe deep. When you breathe light, there is less negative pressure in the upper airway. When you breathe slow, there is less negative pressure in the upper airway. When you breathe deep with optimal amplitude of the diaphragm, this increases lung volume and with increased lung volume, the throat is stiffer and less likely to collapse. When we hit a certain age, we have an increased susceptibility to putting on weight. We put body fat on the torso, on the throat, on the tongue. As the tongue gets fatter, it occupies more space in the mouth. This encroaches the airway. As the throat gets fatter, it also narrows the airway increasing resistance to breathing during sleep. But also we put fat on the belly. And as we put fat on the belly, it impedes the movement of the diaphragm. Impeded movement of the diaphragm reduces lung volume and the throat is more liable to collapse. In order to achieve light, slow and deep breathing, nasal breathing is absolutely paramount. We're talking about nasal breathing with the tongue resting in the roof of the mouth. Three quarters of your tongue should be resting in the roof of your mouth pressed against the palate, with the tip of the tongue just before the top front teeth, but not touching against the top front teeth. To get an idea of where your tongue position should be, you could do the pop sound, and it goes like this. In order to make that sound, you have to place your tongue in the roof of the mouth. That's where your tongue should be at all times, both during wakefulness and also during sleep. 
Ideally, you wake up with your tongue resting in the roof of the mouth. The tongue has got two places to be. It's either in the roof of the mouth or it's encroaching on your airway. In order to maximize airway space, breathe in and out through your nose with your tongue resting in the roof of the mouth. In order to normalize minute ventilation, breathe light, breathe slow and breathe low.